Okay. Um, okay, I'm recording here. So this is our Monday meeting of the working team. Welcome everybody and welcome world. So I'm going to start with a brief presentation and here's the presentation about uh, how do we know the the process is on track. So if you click on this link, I'm sending this into the chat box, you can watch with me. Otherwise, I'm going to just share my screen here. So I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, or you can take a look at that doc and follow me along or you can just watch my screen. I am I am trying to share my screen. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Um, okay, so here it is, this document. And um, the idea is like, what's this overall process of how do you know, like, you know, when we have a lot of different people working on a CAD and, and, and you know, especially when it gets more complicated later as there's more people working on this, how do we, um, let me mute, mute everybody as I speak here. Um, yeah. Um, as we work on this, how do we organize all this work to be effective and everyone's working together? So I put together a little document about um, like how do we improve the swarm development process? And I want to get your feedback, like how you know, since we've been at it for just a little bit, how how we think it's going and what are, what are the gaps and blocks to this process? Uh, I know that some of the gaps is definitely understanding the process. That's that cultural literacy of understanding how this whole thing works, which is new for many people. But um, so let me let me go at this. So so I started by looking at this diagram, this hairy diagram, and then when I looked at it, this is the development template, like all the different steps that we have. But functionally, it's kind of I don't know, it's kind of hard to follow or kind of useless in some way. Except it does have all the steps in there. But I decided, okay, let me not go into any of that. Let's just go to um, kind of explaining how we go about development, so it's more more. Uh, tractable for everybody on the team and including anybody who wants to join the team so um, so the problem statement is how do we know like so we're in the middle of the design process we've got different modules being in process we've got CAD we've got some instructionals we've got um, primarily CAD and instructionals some bill of material work happening but how do we know it's done and and or it's or it needs more work and by the way, if you can't hear me well, I mean you can you can view this video, so don't worry about if, you, if the this is bad because I'm re recording it. If the sound is bad on your side, by any chance. But so so it's important to know the definition of done for the CAD, the bill of materials, and the instructionals. Well, why? Because the more that the team knows about what the process looks like, the more people can take initiative. And then the process manager, who we don't really have one right now, it's me, I mean, I'm trying to manage the process, but we really need a dedicated person for that. So the process manager, if people know what's going on, the process manager is not carrying all the burden. So in bottom line is projects are executed more effectively. That's the idea. Uh, when people know how to assess whether something is finished or not. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to back up to what our standards of completion are, and we're developing products for that lend themselves to extreme manufacturing, meaning the rapid one-day builds. So that means the requirement for our instructionals is pretty high. It means we don't just have like your average Joe instructionals, but really good ones, and where we have streamlined everything so that we know that we can do the build in a single day because that's what we're doing we're saying we're gonna run workshops where we build these things so you have to be efficient on all counts like like low parts count easy to source low cost people scale simple procedural simple procedures simple tooling safety in the build process retaining high performance while retaining modularity and scalability so our documentation standards have to be extreme it would be nice if we can, like for example, if we've got a design, how do we know it's working and how do we know we can build it? Well, some of the things we can check is the is the uh, consistency between our bills of materials and our CAD and our instructionals because they're all related. They're all based on a CAD and because we have the CAD asset fully in the free CAD, then we can actually do some cross checks and verifications. So the development process 
starts with our breakdown. So we break the different modules uh, modules up, people were working on the different modules, but then at the end, like right now, we're trying to integrate it. We've designed some of the modules and now we're putting them together into complete machines. But then at the end of the day, we want to make sure that everything is on track, that we haven't like mixed up parts or anything like that. So we got to verify the bill of materials. We got to verify that the build steps are correct. And we can do things like the short videos where the, the to me, the ultimate mark of a completed process is where we got up to the short videos where uh, I mentioned that in another meeting before but basically we learned just to review that um, last year when we did the 3d printer workshop we learned that a very very effective tool for how we can get everybody to finish on time and have everybody help one another is if we have very short looping videos about 15 seconds and each 15 second video would get us about 15 minutes of build time. But the key part there was that everyone works together and, if so, and always somebody finishes first and they're kind of waiting around. So the idea there was whoever finishes first helps everybody else. Whoever finishes second helps everybody else until there's only one person left who's finishing last and everyone's helping them. So what this does, it assures that the, everyone finishes on time and a scarce resource, which is guidance, is provided. So not only the workshop instructors, but the people in there, they're like, okay, here, people, we've done it. I know how to do it. So then everyone else steps in as the instructor. And that way you can finish much faster than before. So that's the general idea of the the rapid fire, the, the very short video instructionals being the hallmark of a completed development process. That means we've done the CAD, we've done the instructionals, and then we've even done the videos. But then the block is, well, how do we do the videos if like only one or perhaps one person has the final machine? Like I have the final machine that's gonna be built here, but I can't do all the videos. I can do some and I can do as much as I can. We still have a month left right now. And by the way, um, because we're kind of a little behind, I'm going to call the event for April 29th instead of the 22nd. I haven't posted it last Friday. We were still missing a couple of things, like the final, uh, like the cat of the mini version, um, definitely the infographic, the video. I still haven't done that, so I'm planning to do that by Wednesday, so we still have a full four weeks. It's from this Saturday, it will be full four weeks. Okay, so that's the timing, but... Going back to this discussion here, the final step being really good videos that are really, really tight, well edited. I mean, if you have a video, that means you really worked out the procedures. First, we did like um, written procedures, and I'll talk about how we get, uh, I'm going to spend this discussion talking about how we get to the video. So, uh, just a couple of things though in the overall process. I'd like you all to go back to uh, the issue reporting on a 3D printer uh, network, the, the OSC network, the 3D printer group, like uh, Emmanuel mentioned that, hey, we gotta have a place where we can all communicate. So I, I do wanna paste that, I am pasting that. Uh, do use that. Let's try to put everything, work in progress, uh, everything at the OSC network, which is which has got the D, D3D development group there. So. Instead of like spamming Facebook, because people would get tired of that on Facebook on our workshops group or whatever, this the network page is a place where we can all uh, post and just do all this, like everything, the questions and the whole discussion. It should be our discussion forum, like a forum. So definitely use that. So try to shift to that and, and see if we can get all the discussions there because then everybody can help. It's not like discussions on email, but once again, we need some place where uh, there's public discussion outside of email. So checklist is work logging, um, work logging, uh, that's going well. I would like to see some more work logging from people who like m do more of that in the process. Like if you have any questions, you can use your work log to do that. So it becomes a more interactive process as opposed to just having one time before the meeting uh, or like you post it up. Just try to see if you can do more interactive on the logs because like, for example, I know Cedric, for example, has finished this this extruder. I haven't seen it until, like, today, so I couldn't really comment before. So if we could, like, 
do any interim posting on a network or just, just even on a log or by email that would work better I would like to see more back and forth uh, on a team so okay so let's talk about how we treat the CAD and how that works so so we broke down so here this is here's this we're, we're at this thing where we got all these CAD files and and they're like a module like a frame like the extruder like the axis of some sort and things like that so um, I think the best workflow would be if from that CAD like whatever whatever CAD you did you can go to the BOM and the fabrication procedures for that because before we said okay Jose was gonna do like the whole BOM well he hasn't done the whole design of the entire 3d printer so he should probably do his uh, part that he did and stuff like that so I think like in the future we might want to break it down and have the person each person go through the CAD through the bill of materials and through the fab fab means the fab procedures the instructionals because we're breaking it up by modules and a person should continue that because they're familiar with it and we have the CAD so I think it makes a lot of sense to to continue not like just give the bill of materials to somebody but everyone does their own and then at the end we combine it so at the end is the integration step is where we combine that all into one uh, but we shouldn't have really one person too early do that maybe maybe we try to do the BOM too early because uh, I know there's still some adaptations happening to it uh, and then we finalize so I propose that kind of workflow and I want to get your input a little later but okay so let's go to um, how the CAD relates to the BOM but okay you can take the CAD once you have it uh, once it's you have your overall file you've got the breakdown into the parts well all that a BOM is is basically you list those things in a spreadsheet put a part description to it and put a link to the sourcing so that's all it is and then from the CAD we can get the exploded part diagram the diagram exploded part diagram would be a very useful thing we haven't really done that but the way you can do it is in a in a cloud editable doc like the Google Docs here um, just make cut and paste into the doc put numbers by it name the part and if it's the same part just use the same number if it's a different part then go up to number two and three and four and so forth so basically once you label it you know the unique part count for that module and if you if you count up all the numbers you get the total part count so that should be transparent within the exploded part diagram that's why I would like to see that happening because then you can create the bill materials pretty much naturally from the exploded part diagram um, so here I just show some instructions um, so the exploded part diagram verifies that the CAD is complete if all parts can be separated within a CAD like I noticed some people were saying that they can't separate the files the parts in a CAD typically we want the CAD some some CAD file to be broken down to all the parts I know we have module files and we have overall files but in the module files we could we should have the breakdown absolutely to the smallest part nothing should be like a union of more than one part unless we're buying that as a whole thing and even for the extruder we should break it down because then we also want to open source the extruder and build it ourselves not rely on the fact that we just have this one part of the shelf so there there it is um, on the BOM the bill of materials uh, quantities are obtained from the exploded part diagram description is obtained from the link uh, to find the link of a certain part you gotta search the web or link to one of our free CAD files. Okay, next. Um, now you can also do the visual bill of materials, which would be not only the exploded part diagram, but it would also have links to the parts. So you can, like, just for people's awareness, like someone, say, downloads it, they can click on all the parts, kind of get a feeling for where everything is. So it could be very useful, uh, definitely a useful asset. Uh, once again, you number that. Uh, get you the unique part count okay but let's keep going here um, so the point about the, the exploded part diagram is it verifies the CAD and it gets you the part count so uh, the and I reiterate why the parts must be se separable in the original CAD because we want to one do fabrication drawings and if you do the sorry the fabrication procedures um, procedures and the procedures rely on the fact that you have to separate the whole thing from the build from the very very parts so you need to have the separable 
part files and also if you want to do do cam files which are computer aided manufacturing such as STLs or anything else you have to have it, everything broken down into the individual parts or otherwise you can't print them or you can only print them as one object which which if you for example print something as one object you would not be able to put the parts inside that belong inside that object if if that thing is supposed to be made of many parts like the extruder you can't put the internal pieces if you print the outside casing in one piece okay so to show separability of parts you can hide and unhide parts in FreeCAD so in FreeCAD you know that when you select something you can if you hit spacebar if you select an object it will hide and you can hit spacebar again to to unhide it so it's very useful um, so for explored part diagrams an easy workflow there is to use cloud editable docs to do that so now let's get into the instructionals because we're getting to instructionals and I do want people to to help on the instructionals and then actually help out on getting towards the videos so two ways to generate instructions one you can hide and unhide parts in FreeCAD so on the top top thing here top string of arrows there basically you have like the first part you, you unhide the next part to it and that's the second part third and fourth fifth and sixth you know until you you generate the entire thing with the parts appearing in an order of build that would get you an essentially a simple instructional or you can move parts in FreeCAD as well and take screenshots there like if you want to add these two parts here to the FreeCAD uh, pr procedure that you're taking screenshots of then you would um, take a screenshot of that far away and then screenshot of it in place so there's different ways the hide and unhide is easy moving parts moving parts in and out of the assembly and screen capturing that can get you some assembly videos and we do want to experiment with that so that we have that capacity in addition to just doing the real video instructional uh, meaning a video camera or a smartphone and actually tripod and videotaping me here for example so um, so here's the deal now how do we figure out I want to talk about the order of assembly and instructional because an instructional um, here's the deal about instructionals we have to do it and we have to figure out the order and if you think about it, it's like a jigsaw puzzle it's trial and error like if you get a bunch of parts on the table like I bet you could figure out how to build the 3d printer like the axis if you look at a picture of it but it'll take you a bunch of trial and error you'll see like oh this fits here oh this doesn't fits here and and it'll take you a long time and that's the whole point we want to get away from we want to do it build it once if you have proper instructions you build it once but that's what you do and uh, you can do that in FreeCAD you can figure out how things work together we work that out all before the workshop so that we have the one day build it just has to be done there's no magic about it you just look at the parts you kind of examine which you know which goes first and there's tricks of how you can do that so I'm going to discuss that so the point is that the order of assembly does matter it's actually actually critical uh, but it also becomes self-evident once you actually go through the work in FreeCAD to to explore what goes first and what goes second so that's the difference like you know like in a workshop here um, the way you get one day builds is simply when you build once not a multiple number of times what everybody else does uh, you know like people building stuff that is not extreme manufacturing they'll build it once they made a mistake they'll take it apart they'll build it again and they end up actually building the whole thing about three or five times instead of building it once because they have to take things apart and then put them back together I mean I know that because we've done a lot of that that's you know a lot of the prototyping here that's why we're going to this build once theory by doing the full instruction full examination of that um, beforehand so when you get get up to the build everything is verified so just to give you an example of how the you can do freak out instructions here's an example of the the brick press where you have the cylinder coming in then the plates closing up the cylinder so you can highlight and take screenshots you can make instructionals that way so that's that now there's ways you can verify the procedure or the build order by using FreeCAD so I'm gonna discuss that here this is this is uh, about produce this slide here is important about producing build v videos um, but it starts with written instructionals that can end up in FreeCAD videos okay so what do you do so take the FreeCAD assembly make a copy 
uh, delete any unnecessary parts from the file that you're not documenting. So uh, write a build instruction using FreeCAD snapshots, what I just mentioned with the, with the frame, like here. You can take snapshots. Um, hiding and unhiding parts is a very simple way. So that was the example. Now you can verify your build instructional order by confirming that if you hide and unhide parts in the order of assembly, that your action is visible. Do you understand that? In other words, if something, if a part is hidden because like it lies under a certain part, when you try to select it and hide it in a tree view, you won't see what you did in the in a view of the object in FreeCAD because it's behind some other part. Well, that also tells you that that's not the proper order that you would build it because if you can't access or see it, that means you can't build it. It's the wrong order. So you can verify the instructional order. The first, first way to do that is simply observing if what you have done to hide and unhide a part is visible or not. So if you... Uh, and that's when you're working within a, the graphics view of FreeCAD, that's pretty easy because typically you cannot click on things that are inside of other things. You first have to click on things that are outside. So you kind of peel away layer by layer until you get to the inner parts. So that, that should be pretty self-explanatory. And that's, that's the biggest part of how you figure out the order. Now there's another step I'll tell you about a little more. So, so here, I, once again, I'm re-emphasizing post to the... So if you're doing an instructional post to the OSC network, so I'm, I'm trying to encourage the culture of people posting on the network so everybody sees kind of the progress in real life. Um, so if you if you do your instructional, uh, submit it, just put it in um, in an OSC network, the three, D3D network uh, discussion, basically a technical discussion group there so that we can review it, whether it's myself or somebody else that reviews it. So so after the instructional is complete and approved, so we have to approve first that this, the order sequence is, is okay. Uh, then we can write a video script on that. So, and then basically take your, your steps that you wrote and, and write them out as if you were going to narrate a video because you're going to capture this video off FreeCAD, from FreeCAD. So uh, break down the script then into 15 second chunks. That means you can only do so much like you have to be very tight like 15 seconds means that you got to be like no loose no like unnecessary words uh just very tight because that 15 seconds should convert to about 15 minutes of build time in real life so in order for us to do the workshop successfully we want to have about a couple of dozen videos like this very short videos they're looping on the overhead projector and everyone looks at them, and as I mentioned before, how everybody works together, the first person that finishes helps another. And that's that's how we found we can really do effective builds and have everybody help out. So it's the really like a 60-fold compression ratio. One minute equals one hour. So like a six-minute video should get you like a six-hour build um, altogether in 15-second chunks. That's, that's realistic what we're aiming for, about six minutes of video which corresponds to six hours of actual build because it takes you, of course, much longer to build it than you can show that in a video. So the video scripts must be specific and complete in themselves. So to create a video, here's the procedure now. And it may, I don't know how well this is going to work, and I tried a simple prototype just before. It's kind of marginal, but it could be useful. But what you do is in Draft Workbench, you simply take your assembly and move parts uh, according to your... Uh, written instruction and of course you're gonna strip things from the outside because those parts on the outside are the only ones accessible in other words you're doing you're you're doing the action in a reverse order of your instructional that you wrote as the text instructional um, thereby creating a video in reverse order of assembly so to create the video you just capture your screen using program like voco screen screen capture and here's where you can have another verification of the build order. Like when you're actually moving parts by each other, uh, gives you a second hint to whether your build procedure is actually correct. So hopefully we've caught everything by just examining 
everything in detail uh, in the first step here in step three, but this step right now, step eight, can get us additional information when we're moving things around and we see that actually some things hit because the thing has a volume and it hits once you start moving it. You can see that your procedures may not be right or something is not fitting, so you might have to go back to the drawing board and reevaluate your procedure. But um, this is just another piece of information that you're getting from this process. So then the correct FreeCAD assembly video is obtained by, vid by, the, by, by playing the screen capture that you did in reverse. In other words, you captured a, a disassembly procedure, so in order for that to be an assembly procedure, you have to just play the video in reverse. So then you narrate the script of your video using your 15 seconds chunk, and then edit that 15 second chunk in Caden Live. So that's the, the, in principle, the procedure of how we want to do this. And that may be hard because uh, FreeCAD, like if you, you know, if you look at FreeCAD, uh, it's not so easy to move things in, you know, like the way you drag, drag things within FreeCAD is not super easy. It's kind of jerky, but it can get you, uh, possibly can get you reasonably decent videos uh, that might be usable as actual procedures. So for example, um, and yeah, I mean, you might end up doing a lot of video editing because you move parts, you capture some video. Um, I'm hoping that you can actually video the actual process, how you, for example, take your cursor and you're actually, say, dragging the cursor, moving a part. Well, that's a fake way to do an animation, right? And in fact, that's what the animation workbench in FreeCAD is supposed to do. So that's something we haven't learned. We would probably want to look into that, but short of having the assembly animations within FreeCAD functionality, we can do the screen captures uh, of us moving things or stopping moving and could get to be a lot of editing, but the FreeCAD model has everything in it. So in principle, you can make a relatively decent video within FreeCAD uh, by a combination of hide to unhide, as well as the dragging of things into place. So. Uh, definitely people can work on on instructionals within FreeCAD itself, capturing things that become videos, that become our video instructions. Because I'm going to capture as much of the video here as possible, but there might be some steps that we might may not capture, and it would help if others have that in FreeCAD, as videos in FreeCAD. So um, both FreeCAD videos and real assembly videos should both should be used. Uh, once once again, it's time consuming to produce real videos like last time we did the 3d printer workshop We had like five or six videos, but we didn't we needed like ten. We had we were a few short uh, We kind of we did it nonetheless, but it was less efficient So the free cads free cad videos allow a larger team to participate in video creation and uh, Sometimes the free cad videos can be more clear than the real videos because we've got ability to zoom to do transparency selection hiding and highlighting so you can actually emphasize things better in the FreeCAD video screen capture. So using both provides the most compelling form of documentation. So, and then finally, like as the last step of uh, finalizing our instructionals, what we want to do, and, and Jose mentioned this, is creating a build order CAD file, meaning um, creating a, a file with a CAD tree that when you it's actually ordered in the order of assembly as opposed to like kind of like randomly however you you first design the thing so a typical CAD file part tree does not show parts in the order of assembly is the point because whoever designed it probably didn't think about the assembly order at that time so based on the finalized instructionals a new CAD file should be created where the tree view order does correspond to the build order to do this, save every part of the build, part of the non-build order file as a separate file. So you basically save every single piece as a separate file and then import into FreeCAD in the order of assembly. So everything, every single screw, every single part has to be uh, imported in the order of assembly. And the good point about it is the resulting file would now allow a user to manipulate the 3D image and also by using the FreeCAD, which is just very simple hide and unhide, like you don't have to know how to use FreeCAD to open up a file in it, 
somebody can take that file, open it up, and just go through the tree view one by one, hiding and unhiding parts, and they could actually see how the whole thing goes together in order, in the proper build order. So we can, for example, uh, give those files to workshop participants, and they can walk through the virtual build within FreeCAD by using the project tree view. And then also you get another point of validation from that, because if you simply count the number of items you got in your tree view, that will actually correspond to your overall part count. And you'll be able to do that in a few minutes because it's organized and you can count. So that's another validation point. So a couple of things on CAD checklist uh, for people to be aware of. Uh, explode part diagrams, instructions, and FreeCAD video all verify that parts are separate. So we know that the overall CAD file has everything broken down to the smallest part. Uh, then we do the final step, the, the build order corrected CAD file is produced at the very, very end. So we're not ready for that yet, uh, but we, we would want to do that so that people have that prior to the workshop, uh, which will really help them. So checklist for how you do the bill of materials. Um, first of all, the final BOM count is the number of items in the tree view of the assembly corrected CAD file. That's something we can get at the end, very end. Um, you have to make sure that links to sources are shown. So don't just put a name of a part, put an actual link to an actual source. Cost of materials, usage cost. The distinction for usage cost is you might buy like 100 bearings, but you're using 58. So you have to show the usage cost, not the, the fact that you bought 100 in a pack, but that you used 58, so you'd only take 58% of that cost, for example. Now delivery time should be indicated because if someone's organizing a workshop they should know know that like how much time shipping time they need um, we should have two shipping options one is the cheap option which takes a lot of long time and a fast shipping option which takes a very short time but it costs more because of faster shipping number of required items is shown the the quantity of each required item must be shown. The total cost, unique part count, and total part count are also shown. So you sum up the entire cost, sum up the unique parts, and sum up the total parts. So that's a BOM. And then instructionals check checklists. Uh, the instructional order is verified by the FreeCAD hiding and unhiding. So that's something you can work with virtually and definitely get very close, if not exactly to the proper build order then the instructional is converted the instructional the written instructional is converted to a script and then the script is narrated over a video that you capture so those are the three major points uh, so that's kind of that kind of shows um, the overall process of using the CAD to validate some things how do you relate how do you make sure that the CAD is, is proper uh, how do you know that the bill of materials is proper? And by going back and forth between the CAD and the bill of materials and the instructional, you should be pretty sure that um, you have accounted for every part. And I, and I will go back to this part. I think the exploded parts diagram is perhaps the link between just having CAD and just having the bill of materials because if you blow up the CAD into all its parts and, and number it, like an exploded part diagram, basically all the parts with bubbles corresponding to the numbers and the first item of that kind is labeled, you can very easily count module by module how many total parts you have. So I think we should do some exploded part diagrams uh, when we're ready to finalize the design. So that's just that. So at this point, yeah, I'll quit the discussion here and maybe um, any questions or, or comments on this this whole process? And then we can check in as far as where we are and um, what we're doing. Okay, so not not too much um, main comments. Uh, so let's check in where we are right now, because uh, as I mentioned, the the current goal is to publish the actual event by um, by Wednesday, I would say. 
Uh, I can work on it tomorrow and, and Wednesday morning and um, that way we have four complete weeks to go to the end of the uh, to the first workshop on this 3d printer and the status here is yeah I mean I was working on a cable chains if you want to go to the OSC network uh, posting you can see the cable chains in progress there um, but the height sensor works really well I'm just basically cleaning up all the wiring from a big hairy mess to this nice nice bundle and cable cable chain so the thing looks really good and we're working on the so the other thing we're working on is on the two other different versions of the machine which is the d3d mini which is the 8 inch version and the 12 inch version which are both the cuts that we have uh, in the existing uh, metal files that I, the metal cuts I, I already have here so we want to test those and it looks like what we can do um, and this is Emmanuel pointed this out the frame doesn't really need the two inch width on the metal as little as one inch can be enough to attach the the axes to the frames so we can go essentially 16 inch then the next cutout has got 14 inches of uh, width then 12 10 8 so there's actually five, 16, 14, 12, 10, 8. So we're getting five sets of parts. So very, very efficient on the materials use because we're hardly wasting anything. And uh, the smallest being eight inches, which is currently working out reasonably well. We had to adjust the frame a little bit to make sure we have, with the eight inch version, we have a five by five inch print area, which is good. There's five by five inch print areas are available. I already got that in the mail. So I can build that, um, the D3D Mini, which will still have all the features, the automatic leveling and everything else, um, but it'll just be a much smaller printer, still allowing you to print all the parts if you wanted to make yourself a 16-inch version of that printer. So let's check in where we are with everybody. I know there's the two versions in progress, uh, and then Jean-Baptiste, you got the, the infographic work, and then Cedric's working on the extruder so let's check in on all of that and Sheila if you have any more questions so maybe Emmanuel and Jose tell us where you are on those other versions because it would be nice to include within the posting of the event actual uh, CAD of the smaller versions which are all options that people can build either the 16 12 or 8 inch version and probably actually anything from like the 16 14 12 10 8 which will be slight modifications but these are the like the main styles of 3D printers that we can make. Um, okay, would you mind filling us in, Emmanuel and Jose? All right, Jose, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, well, you know what I was doing? I, I was trying to complete a bit of a deal. You already talked about it. And, uh, I was uh, I'm stuck uh, in doing the new uh, interface for the 12-inch version of the extruder, basically. You know. Uh huh. So, what's the coordination there, Emmanuel? Can you speak up on? It? Yeah, because you, you guys I, I both. I can't need... listen to you now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Right. Emmanuel, can you pipe in any, or are you available there? Because uh, I think both of you guys have to do an extruder interface. Um, so one of you has to do it, because I think the mounting system is going to be the same for that. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm back. I, have, uh, uh, I missed your last uh, five, uh, two minutes. Yeah, no, I'm asking if... Um, I think Jose is asking about the extruder mount, because we have to make a different one. Uh, did you end up doing one, or because I think it's something both of you can coordinate on? Yeah, I have. I have. Yeah, it will be clever to use the same one. I haven't touched it. Uh, yeah, I want to talk to you about that first. How to? Where do you want the extruder to be? Yeah. Relation. Yeah, I mean we have to in the eight-inch version, and you can take a look at that. You can go to Emmanuel's log for the D3D can Mini. You see the the axis yeah. extensions. 
Yeah, yeah, I saw that. So let me actually share my screen because I've got that. I've got that up. I can. I made them dump that way that I can increase the the span even more. Right. So here's the D3D Mini. So that's how it looks. The frame. Uh, basically, all the axes are outside in order to get the the larger print area. But the goal was simply to get a 5x5 five five inch print area. And what we're doing here is we're using these uh, these parts here. Those are new pieces. And they're just simply extender mounts so that that you would have uh, you would have the magnets, magnetic attachment on the side using four magnets. Um, and then the the axis just mounts onto them because we just don't have enough room otherwise to make for a five by five inch uh, working area. Now we only need five by five inch in this case, so I don't think you even do you even need them on both sides if you have one side already extended. Right now the travel is four point nine inches. After you account for the end stop, or yes. Okay. So yeah, if if you measure the length from uh -huh. one from the motor to the idler, and then you know remove the yeah. Okay, so I'm seeing like two point seven inches. Uh, not there. You have to measure up to the end of the idler where the idler starts. Right. All right, 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 right. So that's even more. Yeah, uh, but it looks like that's more than 2.7, so it's more like 3.7, and then there's another about 3. It looks like more like 6.7, so more like 5.7. Looks like you got more than 5-inch um, travel there. Yeah, but you have to remove the width of the, of the uh, x-axis. So, because you can print only from the one side, the, the extruder will be on the other one side. You want, uh, maybe I can share, share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. I will do that. Share screen. Okay. So, can you see that? Yep. So, you see that it travels this way. I have it in millimeters, but then you have to to subtract that that width because the extruder will be this way or this way because from from that way the stop is here, but from the other way right. the stop is this from this side of the carriage. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's why I, you have to remove that width. Yeah, you have to remove that width, but right now right you've now, got. If you add 97 plus 93 minus 52. Yeah. Divided by 24, it's, oh, it's 5 inches. 5.4. Okay. So, but where the extruder will go? Yeah, the yeah. Rows, side, um, where? Well, look at where the Z axis is going to be. So the Z axis. What I would do is I would move the z-axis to the inside, possibly, so you have the full z-height. What I would do uh, is put the extruder mounted on top and make it hang off the side of your your platform, your extruder platform. Mount it on the top, and then the nozzle is right below the platform. This way? With, yeah, that way, whichever way allows the nozzle to hit, uh, you have to put in the the five inch bed and see where the nozzle would. It would not be to the side. It would be to the to the but, z axis or away from the z axis. It wouldn't be to the sides. So, not between the rods. No, no. I don't think so. I mean, if it's between the rods, then you're limiting your travel distance. Okay. Uh, between the rods. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, but 
if even if you move the Z axis to the inside, do you see that this carriage stops here? It will not. You will not gain any more. Right, but you would have up to between that and the up and the top, you have six inches, so you have a max of six inches of travel. Yeah, and anywhere you have that now, because if yeah. the bed mounts in these two holes, yeah, these two holes are below, below here. Anyway, I think we may get more space if we put the idler down from the inside and the motor up maybe okay anyway. if the motor is up i'm sensing that there's going to be interference if the motor is down the plate is above the motor at all times so you never have interference okay yeah i would say I would. that um i would probably move it to the inside because that way according to the first inspection it's like you almost have four six inches of vertical travel um but you want it to be inside because the the top of the platform wants to be like right below the wow. okay. the x-axis platform for the, extru the extruder platform you want to have the nozzle reach just below the uh platform so okay. yeah but you're pretty close. That's pretty good. Uh, but you gotta, you gotta. I mean, so I would say, think about how you get this so that the nozzle is just a little below the surface of the platform, and the, and the extruder is probably sitting on top of that carriage. I don't see it being on the bottom. If it's on the bottom, you're you lost so much vertical space already. You won't have any Z travel. Um, so I would sit it on the top because you've got space on top. But the nozzle just has to make sure you go down with it down enough. So it's you're going to have serious geometry considerations there. Um, for which reason you might have to make the z-axis go even higher. Because you have to make somehow that the platform reaches the nozzle. That's a very specific geometry that's very constrained. Um, yeah. So however you do that, you got to make it work. Yeah, so who, you got to divide it up between you two guys um, as far as the mount, the new mount. Uh, we see that the nozzle goes down quite a bit, so it definitely wants to, the extruder definitely wants to be on top of the. Uh... Yep, definitely the extruder is sitting on top of the platform. Yeah. But it's on top of the platform and off to the, either away from the z-axis or towards the z-axis, and arranged such that you have to constrain it so that it is above the print bed. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's I mean, there's real work there. I mean, you got to just figure that out. Um, Can you listen to me now? Yeah. What if you create spaces, spaces, uh, uh, spacers? And put a, a piece of uh, 3D printed uh, shape with the magnet to lift the x-axis. To well, lift the x-axis, yeah, you could do that too. It's nice to consider that perhaps uh, for modularity reasons you may want to think about spaces with magnets to extend uh, heights and stuff like that. To extend the height vertically. Yeah, for instance, but it's something that in general you can use as a principle for extension of, yeah. uh, you know, positioning of modules uh, in respect to one another. Yes, yes. No, that's right, that's right. If we have to do that, we should. If we don't have to, we shouldn't, right? I mean, if we get enough Z travel, like what I saw in that, what Emmanuel showed, there's potentially six inches of vertical travel. So that would be good enough. I would say that that would be sufficient over making the design have more parts and be more complicated. So if we get like a minimum desirable vertical distance, we should quit at that unless it's only like maybe four inches. Like if we get five or six inches, I'd be happy without doing any more vertical raising because it's about simplicity. You want to eliminate anything that you don't need. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so guys, who's going to work on that? Um, what are your schedules looking like? Cause we kind of like, uh, is there any way we can do this by Wednesday? I really wanted to post the, post the event like Wednesday night, work on it tomorrow and Wednesday and post like Wednesday cool, night. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I I can try uh, before Wednesday and in case if I can't then uh, Emmanuel can pick it up. But I okay. definitely feel close still. How about Jean Baptiste? Do you do you have any time? Yeah, I do have time. How are you on the on the infographic? All right, let's take a look at that for a second. I think we will not lose a lot of space on the scene. All right, is that picture there? That's the. Um, I just put the extruder on top of it, just you know, simply without any mount, any interface. And you see, it goes below the carriage. Yeah. So if you put it on a pla on a mount, then it should be pretty good. It should be just just about the correct height. So That's pretty I good. I just move it. I'm thinking move this to the side. Yeah. Like here. Yep. Yep, that's right. Okay. And you're missing the motor there, so yeah, that that motor will be, yeah, it'll be perfect. Yeah. It'll right. be. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're crashing all the time. Is that how bad it is? Uh, no. It's a, what happens when you import something. Uh, you see here fixed position. Yeah. For some reason, right now, when I import something, it's, this fixed position is true. If that's true, the assembly doesn't work. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I keep forgetting that now. I don't know why it's true by default. It should be false. Because if it's true, you cannot move it. Okay. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's, I for, keep forgetting that. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. But then I will make it. Awesome. Yeah, no, that, that should be good. Uh, so we're pretty close to that, and then it's just a um, little bit on the wire routing. Um, but yeah, what I want to do is, as soon, that's, as soon as that 3D CAD file is complete and you got the new mount, I can build it because i got the frame parts here so that we can, we can also roll that out before the workshop. We can actually build a real one, and uh, that will motivate people to sign up for the workshop. So... Um, Let's see. Should I so, do the extruder mount and what yeah. if, uh, there is work to be done with the with the end stops? Yeah. Have, yeah, you gotta put the end stops in. Okay, so one guy can do the extruder and the other guy can do the end stops. Maybe. Okay. Let's check Our in. End stops just you just put them there or they need modifications. Uh, the way you have it now, I think they just the end stops go as is, right? I don't know because we changed the orientation of the uh, you know, top axis. If we have to move uh, something, I don't know. Yeah, um, not sure. Okay, um, okay. So let's check in. Let's just check in on. Um, Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. So I'm look, Jose. I'm I'm looking at your at your CAD. Uh, so you put the extruder below. Looks like. Uh, so you guys can see my screen there. 
Uh huh. So this, Jose, what you have here, that does not work because it. I mean, for for the twelve inches, that would work. Wait, how? You're using a different mount, or? No, that that wouldn't. Yeah, that mount is actually wrong because that wouldn't fit like that, right? The, the you on the mount that you have. That, yeah. Yeah. No, that yeah, that's the wrong mount. But it looks looks good, but it's not the right one. Uh, I don't think it would fit. Right. Um, yeah. So details there. Details have to be done there. But that's that's pretty good. Uh, so in a 12-inch version, we've got the Z on the outside the. Yeah, so we got pretty much everything on the outside there too. We could probably put the put the Z on the inside because we can use a short. You're using an eight by eight inch uh, platform there, right? Heat bed, you mean? Yeah, heat bed. Oh well, I didn't change the heat bed. I was working there But the thing is that in free cut for me, it's very difficult to uh, change parts. Uh, you know. Okay. Once I, once I really have to do a, a new version or an adaptation, then it's, it's, uh, it's a new part. Then it doesn't become it's not so fast, you know. Yeah. Uh, anything we can do about that right now, or? No, I'll just try to. Uh, yeah. yeah no but the bed is is correct it's the right size so what we have to make sure at the end is that we can get all the eight inches of travel um, what yeah. you can do so is instance, uh, I, I was able to change some rods but the one that you see that is uh, sticking out is because I, I wasn't able to change the height there was no way to manipulate the parameter of, of length, you know? uh -huh. Emmanuel, do you know why that would be? I have no idea. Uh, yeah. I mean, okay. It was really weird. Because the rest I could do it, and this one I couldn't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's. Uh, yeah. 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 So we want to have like really clean, clean files. Yeah. The way we organize them, I think one of the things is towards the end when we when we finish the whole design or even the individual parts I mean we should have files of each of the individual parts correct like for example the yeah. rod there should be an, a separate file somewhere like everything should be a separate um, yeah. Yeah, we need to have like a file with uh, all the different parts so that we can grab them and put them uh, in the model yeah because I think Right. For instance, the the idlers are for me it's very difficult to get them like apart as a, as the actual separate parts in a half you know. Right. We need to come up with a like as we treat this as a construction set. What we probably want to end up doing is do your exploded part diagram, and then you have the links within the exploded part diagram to all the parts, and all the parts you can modify. Because like for example, the rod you can you can take the rod and you can make it whatever length so it's probably the workflow we want to develop for the construction set and produce a, an instructional of how we do that so that anybody can modify this to their to their liking um, yeah we have to you think you can um, clean up clean up all these aspects or yeah, yeah. okay yeah yeah, as long as we do it, we probably like at the end we might want to, you know, clean up the whole thing and and kind of like what I mentioned in the presentation about recreating the file so everything is good and and clean. Yeah, perhaps also that's another requirement that we kind of seem to think about how do we attack in a way that they can be modified, you know? Right, right. There needs to be discussion on that. Like we need to create standards. Like I know Emmanuel's talking about. He's all excited about the 
assembly workbench, but then we got to make sure that as he's working an assembly workbench to make things parametric, everyone has to understand it. So that part has to be documented. Like, that's why I want to get some documenters on a team. Like, somebody right now should be, like, doing nothing but managing the CAD files and, like, pretty much managing the library and talking to everybody on a team, making sure the file's the latest, that everyone's using the correct one. Um, that would take some effort. But I think, I mean, I think that's doable through that exploded part diagram. And then we would need some instructions. Like, for every single piece, we want to... We want an instructional to say, okay, here's how you modify the plastic pieces and every single piece. Like that should all be documented for for the novice. Cause because like it, it yeah, I mean there's a lot of information that goes in here. There's a logic of how the things are built. So if someone doesn't know that logic, they're not gonna be able to manipulate the file hardly at all, you know. So yeah. Um anyway. Um, so let's, um, let's move on. Let's just go through this. So Jean-Baptiste, so yeah, I'm looking at your log here. So this is, uh, t tell us a little more. So the Tuesday 23rd, is that, is this the file I'm, I'm supposed to be looking at right here? Yeah, that's right. That's the latest version of the infographic. Okay. Okay. Uh, what more needs to be done? I, is there more labels or? No, that's, uh, that's all that's, the, that's most of the critical text. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Um, yeah, I mean that looks looks pretty good. Um, and I was thinking about now that it, uh, now that I have this much ready, I could uh, go in and add the cable chain too. Yeah, yeah. There's cable chains in there. Yeah. Um, let's see. As far as a couple of the other other labels, were you planning on putting them those in there still? Mm-hmm. I think we gotta put in four That's it? What's the second one? Yeah. Do you guys think that's too much, or is that you think that's interesting for people to hear? Yeah, I think I could fit that in there. I think that'll be good. I think we got to put yeah, in... It, it helps emphasize the idea that uh, they can make a machine the size they want. Yeah. And I think we got to brag about... So I did a like a quick part count, and I, and I believe we're at 40 unique parts. That's it. Like, there's only, like, three different okay. screw types... Um, yeah, it's really minimal. It's 40. That's what I counted so far. So we can put that in there. Um, super low parts count, only 40, 40 unique parts in this entire thing. Um, should probably, um, should probably definitely write it down. Definitely include yeah, that. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, um, you think you can make that, um, just a couple of those items happen for like Wednesday night? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm thinking like uh, maybe yeah, maybe after that, maybe after you finish with that, it, I don't know if we can coordinate you on some of the, the tasks on the the actual CAD so you can actually start playing with that a little more, but what would be what would be the yeah, main thing? Yeah, yeah, man, you know what, we, yeah, I think on the universal axis itself, like on the 16-inch version, we could start by doing a whole explosion of the universal axis, so basically, like, label it with parts um, and links, like what, what I talked about in the presentation. So from it, you readily obtain the unique part count and then the total part count. And that 
then goes like after you're done with that that pretty much translates directly into your bill of materials you just yeah. um, you know you take number by number and you throw that into a spreadsheet that would be I think that would be good because uh, the axis is the number one thing now let me see um, what do you guys think uh, about the whole discussion about the videos or like capturing the screenshots in uh, FreeCAD? Do you think that's possible? I think it should be possible. I haven't actually tried it. Because, um... for example, like uh, if you sh if I'm sharing my screen right now, let me show you how. Like, if I go to the. Uh, for example, the draft workbench, I can move some parts around. Like, for example, I want to take apart this. Oh, no. It's going to fade on me. <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh, draft. I'm going to move move some parts. I'm going to put on, uh, click on the move part. I'm gonna, I want to do this part. Okay, so I'm going to double click on this. And I'm going to click on move it. and then I'm moving it so say you actually take a video see but see it kind of jumps around so it's not that great you'd have to really like move it a little bit like say I moved it apart here see I moved it and then you, yep yep go ahead sorry the move on draft bends you don't have to double the double click is Select the object. Uh -huh. The first click, the first click defines the direction towards with, where you want to move it. Uh -huh. The second click uh, moves it where you want it. So, if you select the object, the first click uh, make a small, you know, small uh, move to see what axis you want to move it, and then. So you can define exactly where you want to move it. Right, but you see it kind of... Right, but it, when you do try to move it, it's not smooth, right? So you'd have to... You kind of have to... Okay, so say I want to move that. Oh, where did it go? It disappeared on me. Let's see if I can do this one. Um, so I pick it up. See, I'm moving it. But see if you move it, it always... You know, it would be nice to show, okay, I got it there and I'm bringing it into place, right? That would be nice. But it's, you know, it's not smooth. It's not nice looking, you know? And then when you disassemble it, all you got to do is play the video in reverse and it looks like it's actually coming together. So that'll be nice, but it'll be very rough is the, is the issue. So possibly what we can do as far as the assembly videos, we can say like, I don't know, this is where we really need to learn the, the Exploded Part Animations Workbench. Um, that could help a lot. Or take it into Blender, but we don't have really those skills on a team right now, do we? Can we make nice animations? With it? That that gets into into complex. I'm trying to figure out something that that anybody can do. So, so right now, you can uh, pretty much. I don't know how to do the animations really well. It, it, you can do it, and you might. You can say, okay, you, you move this into, you assemble that into place, but you might have to say, okay, I'm moving this one in, and then it comes into place, into its final place, so you'd have to do that in uh, within editing. The nice thing about this, like in a video mode, would be that, you know, it's... It looks, the CAD looks pretty nice, you know, it does look pretty nice. I mean, we can do this rough kind of uh, moving things into place, you know. That could work somewhat, especially if you, like, close up to it. Like, say, you know, I got it here. 
Okay, so I click on it to move it. Yeah, that's pretty jumpy. Yeah, but you can definitely... You know, but like if you capture a video and you're talking about it, you can hide and unhide parts and that would work res reasonably well, I think. That would go do like cinematographically, it would look pretty good because here like when you move things around, I mean, it just looks... It's not smooth at all, you know? But Martin, you can do stop motion uh, kind of video. And yeah. Fade, fade out uh, with PowerPoint and then you can just shoot it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that means... It's also an animation just to move, actually, I mean, along the axis, just to show that it will move, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would be much more complicated than than we we would like it to. Because if if you could do like smooth motion here, then the idea of moving and then reversing the motion by playing in reverse that could get you like this perfect assembly. You know, that would be nice. But yeah, it's just too rough. Yeah, you can do the stop motion kind of kind of situation. Um, and just even even the video of where you simply screen capture instead of doing a presentation. Just basically the the video recorded version of your steps, you know, where you where you talk, where you also put your voice over that. Um, so that would be that would be good. So um, yeah, yeah, I think that's we could definitely do the simplified version. I mean, the video we want to have that, and yeah, we want to have it playing on the overhead because it's you know you see the visual and you hear the description and it makes it really easy but it'll take a little bit of time but that's but that's the point like getting getting really nice videos does take a bit of time that's why i wanted to separate it and divide it up between different people so we have different different ways to show that yeah but hopefully this thing is so simple that it's like the videos become really simple because it's um yeah it's sim I mean, by design, we're pretty simple already, so that we have that going for us. Um, okay, so let's go to real quick. Uh, so, so Jean Baptiste finish this up by Wednesday, and then um, if you can get around to some of the instructionals according to how we discussed uh, how I made the presentation, does that make sense, Jean Baptiste? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, we'll do that. And then let's let's go to Cedric. So Cedric, tell us about. So we we're, I got Cedric to work on uh, the extruder, which is the Prusa extruder, which can do the E3D nozzle, which is a more advanced nozzle. And that's looking pretty good. But let's let's talk about that. So um, look at that. So tell us about it. So is this actually? How is this different? <laughs> This is the last lesson of what I have done. So this is... Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, if you look to the, this, the extruder from Pusha, yeah. he has a place to, uh, to put the, the sensor of the axis. Yep. I suppressed this part. Uh-huh. And have it on the D3D printer. So, so it, it, it is at the left of the image that you will see. So I, I suppress this part for the uh, z-axis. And also, uh, when you mount the, 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 the extruder from Porsche, you mount it uh, by using screws at the front of uh, the, the extruder, at the front of the motor. So the... No, uh, you yes this face. Yeah. So you, you you use this face to to screw the extruder to the z axis of the uh, pressure. Uh -huh. So I I remove the parts uh, in this face. Okay. In the, the, the holes, I remove the holes on this face because we don't have it, and I replace. I use the our uh, motor. So that we can use our motor to put it in the in our uh, digital printer. Yeah. And, um, yes. 
So you're saying that this right now yeah. would mount in our existing. So because we, we use yeah we use the, the motor the Neymar motor to yeah to I love it to yes to hold it on the this with so I remove the pressure motor and put the Neymar motor this this motor. Because well, all the, right. The, the, the pressure motor is a little. Uh, uh, the the X of the pressure motor is not too uh, uh, great. It is not too long. It is the I see. The one one it is half. It is half of this motor. Right. Okay. So I put this motor. Uh, yeah. What? The, what? What? The, I use. Uh, I. This looks yes. This is uh, the modification that I put. I have added to the cushion. So you have uh, in this uh, extruder you have two fans. The first fan, this the fan at the left of this image, which is for the uh, nozzle, and the fan at the uh, this that you have hit on it is the fan of the. The heater uh, block. Heat sink. Yeah, heat sink here. Yeah. Wow. So this this works. This looks like it will work with us now. Now the only thing we need that's gr that looks pretty good, man. So how'd you do this? You t you took the. I I searched for. Uh, you drew this up. It's 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 a it's a file for, uh, in GrabCAD. Oh wow. They had the file in GrabCAD. Uh, so I, what? They had the file in GrabCAD? Yes, yes, yes. I, they have the, the total uh, uh, free, um, uh, CD file of the Prusa printer. Okay. In step file? So I, so I think I, I just took the... I don't look it and just took okay. the... Okay. Okay, you got to put that on file. your log. Put that on your log. Because, uh, yeah. The link, the, the link to the. Yep. To this file. Yeah, to the original that uh, you got this from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please do that. Okay, one question though: Where are we gonna mount our sensor? What sensor? The height sensor. We need that. Okay, so. I don't understand the sensor. Okay, yeah, sensor. We need a sensor on this, so we need to educate you on this so here um and also just one more question you somehow you deleted the if you look at my screen you put this file but it appears that wait is the old file there okay okay no the or okay the other file is elsewhere right let's see i have put the two versions because i i forgot something I forgot something and I updated. Uh, ah, okay, okay, no problem. Um, I yeah, think yeah, yeah. the amount for the height sensor is there. Okay. Yes. I don't. The, the, Where? You, you asked for the sensor for the heat. Uh, sensor for the, the sensor uh, of, height. The, 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 so. The heat sensor? No, no, no. Different. Um. Can you... Yeah, I'll show you what I mean. Um, network, I think there's a picture of it at network.opensourceecology.org. Well, this is looking good, so we can basically add this, just pending this minor minor correction. That's that's really good. I mean, that's a bunch of work that went into that. Uh, so let's see if we can find this. And yeah, guys, so please like put all your discussion and comments on the network.opensourceecology.org. Um, okay, so let's see. Oh, I don't know. Do I show it anywhere? You gotta show it somewhere. It's somewhere, but it's hidden. It's. Oh yeah, and Jean Baptiste, I think the sensor, the height sensor, that's something we might want to add as well. Okay, let me see if I can freeze this. Um. Okay. Yeah. Hold on. I'll show you a picture of this. Uh, 
I uh, can't really see it. But there's a sensor, the the same kind of one that he has. And it's in a bill of materials. So you have to look at that sensor and mount it. It's it's the same thing that he has. It senses the height of the bed from the the extruder nozzle. Does that make sense to you or no? No? I can email you that with the specifics on that, but you'd need to add it. But that's pretty good. That's pretty good, though, what we've got here. I mean, that's pretty much like after we, you know, after I do this, um, do some videos of this existing one, I, I, I'll think of printing out this one. But the thing, thing would be, where do we get those fans and everything, all those parts? The big fan, the smaller fan. Can you can you look into that? Hard to get with the fan. It's hard to get. Hello. Yeah. You ask me. Oh yeah, here it is. Here it is. It's, it's a, the, yeah. The fan. Yes. I, I yes. Yeah, yeah. We need to source all the parts, like all the little the bearing, like the screws and and the every single part in there. Would you mind working on that maybe this week? Instruction. Yeah, the instruct yes, both the instructions see. and the specific I, parts. I it, you can see it in my workload. You did? Yes, I began something Let's see Cedric log. log. Oh, but it is Cedric log. I made a quick link to that uh, forward to Lego log. Um, Let's see, you got that going on? Instructions, okay. Excellent. Oh, okay, so you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, you gotta share uh, that, uh, wait, wait, share wait. that to the public. I, I will share it. Uh, yeah, share it with the public, because it has, ver don't worry about anybody, anyone hacking it. Share it with the public, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am doing it. Okay, excellent, excellent. So why don't you continue working on that? That's excellent. Uh, let's see, so Jean-Baptiste, Sounds like you got plenty to do. Jose and Emmanuel, I think you guys are pretty good, right? Or what else do you need? Uh, I, I hate sensors. Yes. I think it's, I don't know if it's already there. Look my screen. Yeah. Uh, please, can you, can you, can, can you try to go to the... That's a heat sensor, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the heat sensor. Can you, can you, Very easy to put it if, yeah. if it's not there anyway. Yeah. Yeah, well I think we I don't see really where that is because I think he removed it, so but that's okay. It's okay, we'll add it back in. This is great. This is uh, good teamwork people. So we can do this and then we can do No, not a heat sensor, different. I'll I'll email you about it because I actually gotta go. I got a we got another guy I got a meeting with. Martin, can you go to the link of uh, of my instruction? I will see if I I share it to the public. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. It's good. Excellent, bold type. Okay, fits our style perfectly. Love it. Oh, this is great, man. And you gotta teach us how you do this. Yeah, that's pretty good. Wow. All right. Oh, this is good. Yeah, man, if you can make an exploded part diagram like what we talked about. Um, uh, yeah, parts. Give me some parts. So I want to build this. This is really good. Yeah? How to... How to do what? No, no, I... You were asking something... And these are renders from where? From FreeCAD or from Blender? Uh, the, the rendering. Yeah. This is from FreeCAD. Holy cow, look at this guy. I never did that. It's pretty good. You should, uh, well, we'll have to write an instructional on how to do that. We gotta, we're, we're recruiting some documenter people. We're trying to build a team. We got another guy, Hart, who's uh, recruiting with us. 
Uh, so yeah, we got to build, keep building the team because right now we really have only a few people. But as soon as we build a team, I will we'll go keep going at it. Yeah, but this is uh, yeah, I'm really glad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so keep going with with this, and then um, if you could get us a complete bill of materials on that, we can build it. Yeah. Because I'd like to build it, like, not this week, but maybe, like, next yeah. week. Mm-hmm. Yep. That will be awesome. Um, because, yeah, I'm, I'm getting pretty serious about the... Um, as far as um, printing out things like the polycarbonate glazing and the fence posts, I want to do that. I want to start doing that. And we need a big extruder to do the fence posts and things like that. So, okay. Uh, what else we got? Because I got to get going here. Um, do you guys feel like you got enough to go on? What are other questions outstanding? I'm good. Okay, you're good. Jose, you've got stuff to do? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, you've got the infographic, and then you got um, start an instructional for the axis. Yeah, try to try to do that according to what we talked about today. Uh, looks like Cedric, Cedric, you're pretty good to go. Continue on an instructional and get the bill of materials. And then... Um, Sheila, how are you doing? You got uh, all you need, or we need to follow up? Um, yes, I still. I was just trying to keep up to speed with everything. Yeah. Do you have everything you need to continue on the on the prototype in in Germany, or you can? Why don't you email me with some specific questions? Because uh, I gotta get going right now. I'm supposed to be talk talk to somebody else right now, but you know maybe email me see if you got specific questions on where you're at and what you need to do next. That'll be good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no problem. All That's, right. That sounds good. Anything else before we close off the meeting or? Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Cedric. Yes, uh, just uh, uh, can you email, uh, don't forget to, to mail me what we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, right. So so if you look in a lot, in a, okay. can you see the the chat? Because mm -hmm. that's, that's actually what he's talking about. That's that's what we can, yeah, that's what we need to, to include. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's... Well, no, 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 it's not that. It's simpler. Sorry, it's not. I'll email you. No, that's not the right thing. We don't want that. Uh, that's too complicated. Yeah, I'll send you the link to the simple one. That Just look at the... Um, wait, is that from the bill of materials? Well, I made a mistake. I scanned the wrong sensors, but... Uh... Yeah, it's from the bill of materials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Right. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Look at this. This is what we want. Uh, let me uh, he, click on this link here. That's that's the kind of thing we want. That I got from the bill of materials. We can use one of those. We probably want. We don't want a two this millimeter. Is for, this is, yeah, this is for height sensing. This is the Okay. Yep. This, this is, it is the sensor for the Z axis. Correct, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, I will put it. Yep. We want the one that's four millimeters, not the two millimeter, because they have different distances, and we want the one that says four millimeters on it, uh, if they have one, because two, two millimeters is going to be a little too short. So we need to go to uh, four millimeter. Okay, yeah, so include that in the design and, and that's that's about it. Okay. Well, that's great because I, I look forward to building that. That's, and I'm glad that the um, looks like what you have right there will mount exactly to our same universal mount, which is awesome. <laughs> that's really good. Total interchangeability. Mm -hmm. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish like the cable chains. I'm going to take a video. I, I got to do the video probably tomorrow, tomorrow or Wednesday. But basically I'm aiming to be publishing all day Wednesday. Just get the announcement up and get it out the door because uh, we want to get this thing going. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, anything else from anyone before we, we take it, call it a day? Okay, that sounds like everybody's good. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and we'll continue. If you haven't filled out your log, please do so right after this meeting as, as far as the time log so we can keep track of the hours. We'll continue building the team, and I'll stop the recording here. Thanks a lot, guys.